Hello, this is the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service with reports and analysis from across the world. The latest news seven days a week. BBC World Service podcasts are supported by advertising. This is the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Jonathan Savage and in the early hours of Saturday the 7th of May, these are our main stories. Amnesty International accuses Russia of doing nothing to stop its forces committing widespread abuses in Ukraine. President Zelensky says the world can't wait a decade for justice and sets out his conditions for peace. In Yemen, positive signs after years of conflict. The Saudi coalition frees more than 100 prisoners. Also in this podcast, at least nine people have died and many others injured in an explosion at a hotel in Cuba. There will be no balcony scene for the Duke and Duchess of Sussex at Queen Elizabeth's Platinum Jubilee celebrations and... Echo Romeo, Charlie Foxwood, Ukraine Air Rescue. We are just uh, about uh, two minutes away from the Polish border. Medical supplies in, refugees out. The German pilots on a mission to Ukraine. Amnesty International has accused Russia of doing nothing to stop its forces from committing widespread abuses in Ukraine. The human rights group said there was a pattern of large-scale abuses over the past 10 weeks. At a news conference in Kiev, the head of Amnesty, Agnes Kalamar, said there was evidence of extrajudicial killings and indiscriminate attacks on civilians. These have been repeated over the last uh, 70 days. So I think we are beyond attributing them to some, um, how you put it, uh, lack of discipline. I think you can use that excuse within the first two weeks, but after 70 days, that cannot be the case. The fear among some people is that holding anyone accountable would be, if not impossible, then at the very least impossible to do quickly. President Zelensky says he won't stand for that. On Friday, he was the guest of the London think tank Chatham House, answering questions via video call through an interpreter. The BBC's security correspondent Frank Gardner was there. I asked him how likely speedy justice really is. There are two aspects to this. One is gathering the evidence that will stand up in a court of law. The other is actually getting hold of the perpetrators. The first part of it is going to be relatively straightforward because this is a modern 21st century war where everyone's got smartphones and it's relatively easy to document the evidence. I don't think there's any dispute about what has happened and who has done it. But following that chain of command all the way back to Moscow or St. Petersburg or wherever is going to be quite difficult and it'll be almost impossible to get these people out of Russia. They're not going to be turning up at at The Hague or anywhere else for a trial. But there is a really big concerted effort now to get prosecution-ready files up and running and that it shouldn't take 10 years. I mean, this is something that President Zelensky said very clearly today. He said, I don't want this hanging around for 10 years. He's thinking, obviously, I think of the, the Balkan war trials, which took so long to come to fruition. He said, these should be like normal criminal cases. Let's prosecute them and let's get it done. Because Ukraine is really hurting. You know, I'm not going to shock your listeners, but I mean, some of the barbaric mutilations that have been carried out on civilians and soldiers alike, with extraordinary cruelty and sadism, have got to be called to account. And one of the things I noted about his address to us in Chatham House today was, again and again, he used the words hatred and cruelty. He said, we are just staggered at the level of hatred and cruelty exhibited by these invading Russian forces, that their violence is wanton and indiscriminate. Tell us a bit more about that that Q&A that addressed to the Chatham House think tank in London, because you were listening in and and you asked him a question. Mm. Yes, my question was this. What would Ukraine accept as the minimum in a peace deal with Russia? What's your baseline, basically? Would you be prepared, for example, I said, to go back to the status quo of February the 23rd, the day before the invasion, which was far from ideal because... Even back then, OK, Russia hadn't invaded, but it was backing the two breakaway republics that had been waging war for the last eight years on Ukraine's eastern borders. And he said, yes, they need to go back to where they were on February the 23rd to cross back over the lines and withdraw from where they've, where they've invaded. To stop the war between Russia and Ukraine, this step should be 
regaining the, situ- the situation as of the 23rd of February. You are right. They have to fall back and uh, go beyond the um, contact lines and uh, they should uh, withdraw the troops, of course. He could have gone further, couldn't he? He could have talked about Crimea. He could he have didn't. talked about eastern Ukraine. So why mm. didn't he? What does that speak to? Well, I think he knows Russia's not going to give back Crimea. It's a strategic peninsula jutting out into the Black Sea. It's home to Sevastopol and the Russian Black Fleet. They are not going to give that back. So the negotiations are going to come down to areas in eastern and southern Ukraine. And let's see how this goes after May the 9th, what announcements, if any, are made on Russian Victory Day. I think there is a fear in Ukraine and in the West that the next phase, phase three, could well be a joining up of Russian or an attempt to take Odessa down in the south and to link up Russian forces from Crimea with their allies in Transnistria, which is the breakaway part of Moldova in the southwest. If that happens and they were able to take or even bypass Odessa, then Russia would have sealed Ukraine off from the sea. And that would have huge economic impact, not just for Ukraine, but for the world in terms of grain exports and trade. Frank Gardner. Russia and Ukraine say a further 50 civilians have been evacuated from the Azovstal steelworks in the embattled Ukrainian city of Mariupol. The figure was confirmed in separate posts by Ukraine's Deputy Prime Minister Irina Voreshchuk and Russia's Ministry of Defence, which said 11 children were among those rescued. Our correspondent Laura Bicker reports from Dnipro, northwest of Mariupol. The Russian president has already declared victory in Mariupol, ordering his forces to seal off the sprawling steelworks. Hundreds of Ukrainian fighters have used the plant to make one last stand, even under constant Russian shelling. Hundreds of civilians have also been trapped in the vast network of tunnels under the site. Around 100 women and children have been saved in an operation by the United Nations and the Red Cross. Another evacuation attempt is underway, despite reports that the plant is still under Russian fire. And now there's also a plea from the families of those still fighting. Svetlana is begging for world leaders to help save her only son. It's It's horrible. Horrible to know that your son is fighting and has nothing left to fight with in a city that is completely razed to the ground and seized by the occupiers. I would give everything in exchange for him to survive, for everyone who is still there under the bombardment to survive. Vladimir Putin says Ukraine should order these fighters to lay down their weapons. Capturing the whole of this shattered southern city would be symbolic for Moscow ahead of its annual 9th of May Victory Day celebration. In the depths of the plant, this small remaining Ukrainian force sing to keep spirits high. They may never surrender, but their families say they are prepared to act as a human shield to help them get out alive. Laura Bicker. Ukraine Air Rescue is a group of self-funded pilots from Germany who volunteer to fly medical supplies to the Ukrainian-Polish border, then help evacuate vulnerable refugees on the way back. The BBC's Sira Thierry followed them on one of their missions. Echo Romeo, Charlie Foxworth, Ukraine Air Rescue. We are just uh, about uh, two minutes away from the Polish border. 11,000 feet above the ground in a tiny bonanza loaded up to the roof with yellow boxes full of medical supplies. German volunteer pilots Stefan and Simon are on a mission to the Polish-Ukrainian border. We had an emergency request coming in from a hospital in the Ukraine. If there's somebody suffering where a village had been bombed, all of a sudden they have 10 times of the supply that they need. And it has to be delivered in no time. They're flying in a convoy of six planes, transporting donations of cancer treatment, insulin and medicine to treat the wounded. But also body bags and forensic kits. There are so-called rape kits. That means uh, for the freed up uh, villages, there were little girls aged 15 and older that had been raped. And within these forensics kits, you can prove that they have been raped within a certain time span. 
and then it has to be decided if they're giving the pill to prevent any pregnancy. Most trucks need several days to reach the border with Ukraine. But if a doctor calls in the morning and it's really urgent, the pilots can bring supplies within 12 hours. The amateur pilot was on holiday when the war broke out, and like many people, he was desperate to help, recalling his mother's stories from World War II and the Berlin airlift. We were thinking about what the, the Allied troops did for Germany and how they rebuilt everything, especially the impressive pictures about the airlift with the Operation Wittels. The whole city of Berlin had been supplied over a month um, by planes. And uh, we couldn't fly to the Ukraine. They would have shut us down. But um, what we could do is to go as close as we could. Partner organizations are picking up the supplies at Jeshov Airport. Today's delivery is for a hospital in Kharkiv, northeastern Ukraine. Ukraine Air Rescue is fully funded by private donations. There are now 260 pilots signed up to help, some from the UK, often paying for gas out of their own pockets. A flight costs between 1,500 and 3,000 euros. Even here on the Polish side, the war feels close. This is a US Air Force plane and a military helicopter. From the runway, we can spot NATO's anti-ballistic missile systems. If you're feeling sick, you're using this little seat pass, just on top. On the return to Germany, the pilots are giving a lift to vulnerable Ukrainians who would struggle to flee by bus or train. We are trying to reach out to unaccompanied children, handicapped or pregnant women, and I hope that uh, actually we can make a difference. One of them is Anton. The 36-year-old has arthritis and can barely walk. He will soon see his wife and daughter who fled to Germany two months ago. This is my first flight. Uh, this uh, my cinema. <laughs> we just took off from Poland on the way back to Germany together with Anton, who has never left Ukraine. And he's really excited. Anton is a professional painter. He's showing me photos of his family and still life collection. Daughter, why? In Germany, he wants to teach children with disabilities how to paint. This is my favorite dream. <laughs> my, my life. Dream is my life. Stefan hopes they'll soon be giving airlifts to many more people going home. When this silly war really is over, the vision would be that we really fly into Ukraine. Hundreds of airplanes out of Europe. Bringing back people, you know, and then let everybody know this is what we can do when we stand together. A report from the BBC's Sierra Thierry. We're going to turn to Belarus now and the continuing fallout from the crackdown that followed the huge anti-government protests of 2020 and 2021. A court has sentenced the Russian girlfriend of a prominent Belarusian opposition blogger to six years in jail. Sofia Sapega and Roman Protasevich were arrested while travelling on a commercial flight that the Belarusian authorities forced to land in Minsk, provoking international condemnation. Roman Protasevich is still awaiting trial, but Sofia Sapega has been found guilty of charges including inciting social discord and illegally collecting personal information of officials. Franak Vyachorka is a senior advisor to the leader of the Belarusian opposition, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya. He gave his reaction to the sentence to James Menendez. Of course it's shocking, of course it's unexpected, because Sofia Sapega, she collaborated with the investigators and we expect that she will be under home arrest or perhaps released in the in the courtroom. It didn't happen, I don't know why, perhaps the regime decided to punish uh, her and to scare all others who will be publicly um, condemning Lukashenko's regime. She was just in the wrong time, in the wrong place, uh, she became the victim of the uh, cruel totalitarian ruler. What's the current situation with Roman Protasevich then? When's his trial due to start? 
Oh, it's very difficult because, you know, and Sofia and Roman were my friends and I saw them just a few days before they got uh, hijacked from this plane. Uh, Sofia was a student of European Human Rights University. Roman was a journalist, blogger, and we were very often uh, chatting. But when he was hijacked, uh, his personality changed completely. He started to praise Lukashenko and right now he appears very often on propaganda TV channels, blaming opposition, democratic forces, and saying that Lukashenko is doing the right things. So he is very often on pro-state channels, on YouTube, on social media, but it's different Roman. It's not Roman I know. And and how do you explain that? Uh, He became a hostage, and you know, um, when you are in hands of KGB, they can do whatever to you. I don't know how he was scared. I don't know if tortures were were used against him. But the way he speaks, the way he thinks, uh, is not the uh, same Raman I remember. I, I, I'm afraid that this happened to many people who were arrested, detained by KGB. And you, you always have a choice to collaborate and survive. But then you lose your identity and your independence. Or you will be punished, solitary cell torture, but then you will be honest uh, with with yourself. I wanted to ask you just one uh, broader question, because Belarus has obviously been a key ally for Russia in the war in Ukraine. I just wonder, have you got any sense of the public mood in Belarus about uh, Russia's invasion? Have there been any signs of dissent? Uh, Belarusians hate this war. 86% are against the entry of Belarusian troops. Lukashenko actually uh, doesn't have any popular support. Uh, He is a lie of Putin. He's paying his debt because Putin saved his um, uh, political career in 2020. But Belarusians are organizing the sabotage, the diversions, disrupt uh, Russian troops from moving to Ukraine. And the army, as you know, refused to go to Ukraine. Lukashenko didn't manage to force Belarusian soldiers to cross the border. And Belarus, on one hand, is supporting uh, formally Russia. But on the other hand, our guy, uh, refused to go. Frana Vyachorka, a senior advisor to Svetlana Tikhonovskaya. Rescuers in the Cuban capital Havana are searching for survivors after a large explosion devastated the popular Saratoga Hotel. At least nine people are known to have died and several others were injured. Our Latin America correspondent Will Grant is following developments. It does now appear that this was a accident, a gas explosion. It may have been caused uh, either by a leak or by the speculation that there was a truck of liquefied gas outside the building unloading gas canisters which exploded. That comes from the Cuban presidency itself, which does at least for now rule out any foul play or any other questions. But of course, they stressed that investigations were still ongoing. Um, But yeah, a really terrible accident in the heart of Old Havana, the Saratoga Hotel is one of the islands, one of the capital's most recognisable exclusive hotels. It's now simply a pile of rubble. Yes, tell us a bit more about the hotel. It's very popular with tourists and VIPs alike, I understand. Yes, it is. It's um, it's one of the most exclusive hotels in Old Havana. It was apparently uh, closed for refurbishment at the moment of the explosion, so that may be a saving grace, although, of course, there are still um, several dead, um, at least almost three dozen being uh, injured, being treated in nearby hospitals, so it is uh, still a very, very serious explosion. Um, but yes, this was a hotel that's synonymous in Havana with visiting celebrities at the height of the of the thaw between Havana and Washington during President Obama's presidency. Um, we saw Madonna, Beyonce, the Rolling Stones and others stay there. So it's a, it's a well-known place in Havana. Are there a lot of tourists in Havana at the moment uh, with the pandemic, for example? Are things improving? Well, the whole uh, tourism industry in Cuba has been badly affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. I was there just last week and you did begin to see the first green shoots of tourism returning, but the numbers were so, so down on what they were um, at the height of, uh, you know, of the last few years when things were really good in about 2016, 2015. Um, A combination of US uh, sanctions on the island, of course, the, um, the pandemic 
weekend and a number of you know internal problems mismanagement of the economy by the Cuban government means things are very very difficult economically and the fear is for many that this explosion could have an impact on what is the sort of slow reemergement reemerging of the of the tourism industry will grant Yemen has seen years of fighting and a long-running humanitarian crisis. The conflict has pitted a Saudi-led coalition against Houthi rebels backed by Iran. But over the past five weeks, there have been more hopeful signs as a truce has held. And today, the coalition has flown more than 100 prisoners back to Yemen and freed them in a humanitarian initiative. Our Arab Affairs editor, Sebastian Usher, told us more. This was an operation that was overseen by the International Red Cross. They flew these prisoners, as the Saudi-led coalition described them, from Abha, a city in the south of Saudi Arabia, to Aden, most of them there, which is where the Yemeni government has set up its temporary headquarters. But nine of them also went up to Sana'a, the capital, which is controlled by the Houthi rebel movement. Now, there is a bit of a question mark over who these people were. Saudi state TV showed the images of them on board. They were holding white roses. So it's very much, you know, a sense that this is a very positive move by the Saudi-led coalition. It's not... There are two things, perhaps, to bear in mind. Usually these are swaps, but there's no sign at the moment that the Houthis have swapped any of the prisoners they have in return. Also, the Houthis have suggested, I've seen, that these may not have been active fighters anyway. I mean, one has to take this with a pinch of salt, but they've suggested that these are people who may have been rounded up for completely different reasons and they're not who they're said to be. So it looks positive. As you said, it's another sign in the past five weeks that this truce has been in place that there is a momentum building and we must be very cautious about where that goes. But that the truce, which is for two months, could be extended if these sorts of moves continue. But the Houthis, as I say, we need to see what their response is and to see if a big prisoner swap, as had been discussed before the truce came in a month much, much bigger one, involving around 2,000 prisoners from both sides, which hasn't happened. If that were to happen, that would be quite significant. And there hasn't been a swap like that for more than two years. Sebastian Usher. Still to come in this podcast. It's a bit like a sponge. The water's sort of within that sediment layer. So if you squeezed it, the water would come out. Researchers have found new evidence of what lies beneath the Antarctic ice sheet. It's almost a month since flash floods ravaged South Africa's KwaZulu-Natal province, leaving more than 430 people dead and tens of thousands homeless. Dozens of people are still missing and some families haven't been able to bury their loved ones. The ground's still waterlogged and there's also confusion about government help for funeral costs. Tragically, among those who died was a family of 10, including nine children. The BBC's Pumza Fulani attended the funeral. The unimaginable has happened to the Mlalose family. Slindi Mlalose and nine children, aged between two and ten, were killed in the recent floods that swept through KwaZulu-Natal, the worst in decades. They were sleeping when the violent water washed through their home, flattening everything. Almost a month on, some bodies are yet to be recovered. The children's uncle, Tokozani Mlalose, says he doesn't know how to split his grief. I can't even explain. Yeah, hey. It's it's, it's, it's hard losing one person. It's worse losing two. Ten is something else. Knowing that you you, you don't find the other four, they might be somewhere out there decomposing. Yeah, hey, hey, hey. Words can't describe exactly what is inside my head right now. But gee, I can't even gather my thoughts. On a hillside outside Pittamaritzburg, hundreds of community members gather inside a white tent for the mass funeral and to offer support. But the family say that their grief is far from over. Government and private donors have offered millions of rands to help cover the funeral costs, 
but the claim process is said to be bureaucratic and slow, leading to more delays with the burials, as the South African Funeral Parlors Association's Numfundum Koi explains. In the future, government should bring in industry experts. Sit with us, let us tell you how best to do these things. 450 people, for us, we could bury those people in a very short space of time. For this to have taken more than two weeks, honestly, it's putting such trauma and unnecessary stress for families. So in future, if there's anything, be it a pandemic or any other thing, they should know that we are experts, involve us. It's a long road ahead for the many people here, from those who have lost family to those who've lost their homes and livelihoods. President Cyril Ramaphosa has acknowledged that more funds will be required to rebuild, to help mend all that's been broken in this province. Pumza Fulani reporting. Scientists have found evidence of large amounts of groundwater beneath the Antarctic ice sheet. The discovery could have significant implications for our understanding of how sea levels might rise. Professor Helen Fricker from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography in San Diego told us more about the research. We went to Antarctica taking the same instruments that we use to detect offshore oil and gas deposits, which electromagnetic geophysical measurements. And we went there to see if we could use this technique to teach us more about what's underneath the ice sheet in Antarctica. It turns out that this technique was able to detect groundwater, which is within the sediments underneath the ice stream. It's a bit like a sponge. The water's sort of within that sediment layer. So if you squeezed it, the water would come out. So the ice is sitting there on top of this layer of deformable sediments. And within that layer, we have this large volume of groundwater. Antarctica is very, very large. And so we've really just been to one place and we've mapped groundwater there. Now, this means we should take that to somewhere else on the ice sheet and work out whether there's groundwater there under the ice too. We expect that there will be. We expect that there are many more places around the continent where the outlet glaciers have this same groundwater body below them, but we don't know for sure. So we need to take this technique, the EM technique, to other places. And one of the places that there is planned field work to go to is the Thwaites Glacier in West Antarctica. Professor Helen Fricker. If you shop on Amazon or any number of other websites and you aren't entirely sure which specific product to buy, you might look to the reviews to help you decide. In fact, so many of us do that reviews are a business in themselves and that's causing a problem. Now Amazon is taking legal action against companies it accuses of deliberately flooding its site with fake reviews. Our technology editor Zoe Kleinman told me how important these reviews are. If you've ever made an online purchase, the chances are you've checked out a few of the reviews, haven't you, to see what other people are thinking about it. And the UK government did some research fairly recently, and they reckoned that the average household in the UK spends over a thousand dollars a year on products um, that have been influenced by, you know, reading a review before purchase. So they really do play quite a big part in affecting uh, consumer behaviour. I think that some people will be surprised to hear that there are companies behind some of these reviews. What are these companies being accused of? This is such an interesting little market, actually. So what Amazon is saying is that these firms basically set themselves up as a legitimate website. You can go to it, you can subscribe, you can sign up to get either free or discounted products that arrive via Amazon. You write a review, you get paid maybe three or four dollars for that review and it appears on the site. And then the company acts as a sort of broker, if you like, between these reviews and the Amazon seller. So it's getting the discounted products and it's paying the reviewers. And the seller is paying it to boost its ratings. So there's a kind of uh, virtuous circle, if you like, that's going on between the, the, the people that are writing the reviews and they're getting free stuff. The seller's getting lots of positive reviews. So its rankings are going up on Amazon and it looks more popular. And the broker in the middle is getting paid. The scale of it is potentially huge. Amazon said it's taking legal action against four of these companies and it said three of them had almost 350,000 reviewers on their books writing who knows how many reviews
reviews because they're getting lots of freebies and getting money to do so. It's easy to see, Zoe, how such a system could be open to abuse. But are these companies accused of doing something particularly shady or illegal? Or is it just the fact that they exist in the first place, which is a problem for Amazon? Well, Amazon says that it doesn't tolerate fake reviews on its website. And its argument is that none of these reviews are genuine because they're not genuine buyers. These people have either been given the products or they've got them very, very cheaply. And they're being incentivized um, by earning money to write positive reviews in return. So they're going against the terms and conditions of, of Amazon's policies. And um, there are also um, some countries are considering making the hosting and buying of reviews illegal, such as in the UK. So there is a real um, there is a real push to, to clamp down on this sort of thing. Um, Amazon doesn't like it because, of course, it, it gives it a bad reputation. You know, if you buy something and it's got loads of glowing reviews and then it turns out to be rubbish, then you're going to be a very disappointed customer. So it's not really doing Amazon any good at all. And it's quite hard for them to please because it's not happening on their website. This is all happening via a third party. So it's, you know, not really visible to Amazon until um, until they manage to track down one of these firms. Interestingly, of the four firms they've gone after, only one so far has ceased trading as a result of the legal action. The others are still there. You can still go on their websites. You can still sign up and, and join this kind of review factory if you want to. Zoe Kleinman. One of the world's biggest sporting events, the Asian Games, has been postponed as the host, China, battles to maintain its zero COVID policy. The Games were due to take place in the Chinese city of Hangzhou in September. Alex Kapstick has this report. Most international sports events in China have been postponed or cancelled as the country continues its policy of suppressing COVID. This year's Winter Olympics in Beijing was an exception, although participants complained of draconian measures designed to keep the virus from spreading beyond a so-called closed-loop system. The Asian Games, one of the world's biggest multi-sports events involving over 11,000 athletes from 44 nations, was expected to adopt a similar strategy. Lastly on this podcast, to one of the key moments of Queen Elizabeth's Platinum Jubilee weekend, the royal family will appear on the balcony at Buckingham Palace on the 2nd of June to watch a fly past and wave to the crowd at a ceremony known as Trooping the Colour. But royal officials say Prince Harry and his wife Meghan will not be on the balcony with them, and neither will Prince Andrew. Here's our royal correspondent, Sarah Campbell. The Duke and Duchess of Sussex announced today that they were excited and honoured to attend the Jubilee celebrations with their two children. The family have been living in California for the past two years, and this will be the first time their daughter Lilibet will meet her great-grandmother, the Queen. But there is one photo opportunity they will miss – Pre-COVID, traditionally the get-together on the palace balcony as the Red Arrows flew past was one of the key family moments in the royal photo album. But the Queen has decided Prince Andrew and Prince Harry and Meghan will not be invited, having stepped back from royal duties. Trooping the Colour is the first major event of the Platinum Jubilee weekend. A national service of thanksgiving will be held at St Paul's Cathedral on the Friday. A huge stage is currently under construction in front of Buckingham Palace for the BBC Music Concert on Saturday. And on Sunday, as thousands of street parties are held across the UK, a pageant in London will celebrate the Queen's 70-year reign. According to a palace spokesperson, the Queen is looking forward to taking part in the celebrations, but after months of ill health, her attendance at individual events will only be confirmed nearer the time and possibly even on the day. Sarah Campbell. And that's all from us for now, but you can join us on the balcony of the Global News Podcast Palace again later. If you want to comment on this podcast or the topics we covered in it, you can send us an email. The address is globalpodcast at bbc.co.uk. You can also find us on Twitter at Global News Pod. This edition was mixed by Johnny Hall and the producer was Stephanie Tillotson. The editor is Karen Martin. I'm Jonathan Savage. Until next time, goodbye.